Due process, winner of 12 New York and Mid-Atlantic Emmys, including the 2008 award for Best Discussion Series. Quality of life is, is next to nothing, you know what I'm saying? There ain't many opportunities, ain't too much success stories, ain't too, many, ain't too much hope in where you at. Then you're doomed to fail. They've been linked to crime and violence, drugs, even murder. Accused of terrorizing cities like Newark. But on this edition of Due Process, gang members speak for themselves. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Drive-bys, shootouts, drug wars, they're the stuff of headlines, a fact of urban life. And it's not all random crime and violence. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. And on this edition of Due Process, we return to the troubling topic of gangs. And this time with the help of an important tool, a documentary from our friends at the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice with a first-hand inside look at gangs, like this shocking story of one young gang member. You know how you get a funny feeling in your stomach? You be like, damn, something feel wrong. When I get that feeling, that funny feeling sometimes, I don't listen to it, like, because I just lie, I probably got a stomach ache or something. Like, it, it just sometimes, like, you know something about to go down, it be like deja vu or something. Standing outside in front of the, uh, my building, niggas did a drive-by one time. Two times, matter of fact. You're never ready to bury a child. You're always, you know, supposed to be the one to to die first. We stuck at a, a certain part in this world where we from in this ghetto where not many survive all we know is drugs all we know is jail all we know is prison and guns that's all we know so how much can you expect a, a, a person to elevate the doc is called moral panic and with us to talk about what it represents filmmaker akintola hanif in our studio b social justice institute director cornell brooks here with us and in newark Jose Cordero, New Jersey's first statewide director of gangs, guns, and violent crime. Welcome to you all. Jose, let me start with you in Newark. Um, Raymond gave your full title. We know you as the gang czar. What does the person in charge for the state of New Jersey of getting a handle on this problem make of a story like Luis Rivera's? Well, uh, it, it, it does remind us um, that uh, we have a lot of work to do. It reminds us that uh, we in law enforcement have to work hand in hand with communities across the state. Um, it also reminds us that you know we need to do all that we can to allow uh, young people an opportunity to uh, rise above uh, the very challenges that this uh, film describes. And to do that uh, from a law enforcement perspective means that we have to have effective investigations, effective um, plans and strategies to remove uh, uh, elements from our streets that need to be removed so that we can see that improvement and we can see that hope come to fruition. Cornell, let me come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, Moral Panic is an intriguing film to watch, but it's hard sometimes to connect it with an institute that has used more traditional tools, lobbying, trying to organize programs, policy papers. How does it fit into your arsenal? 
Well, the, the Institute is a, a think tank, and we started out by doing a white paper uh, called Do No Harm, uh, which surveyed the best practices, the best research on reducing gang violence. Uh, once we completed the paper, we quickly came to the conclusion that the people who most needed to, to read this paper, to understand the concepts, uh, to buy into these solutions, were not uh, those in the academy, but also those in the community, in our neighborhoods. So we decided to, with uh, uh, Akintola Hamid, to create a film to get the message out beyond the academy, beyond the research institutions, uh, into the community, uh, into police So this department. is not a film for policy wonks? Uh, it's a film for policy wonks, but it's also a film for the people that the policy wonks are writing about. And Akintola, it seems to me um, the question that we all have to ask when we look at this kind of work is how did you get this sort of access? Uh, I actually have family members that are gang members, and the young man who we showed at the beginning, Luis Rivera, was uh, affiliated with a gang, but not an actual gang member. He lived in the neighborhood, and he wore the colors, but he was not uh, directly involved in the gang. But because of my family members, I started documenting his particular set of but bloods, and because of that. Called, but he was killed in what was called a gang shooting. Yeah, they they call it that because there weren't there wasn't anybody there who actually knew the intricacies of what was going on with this young man and why he was killed. He was killed in a random drive by shooting by a crip because he was mistaken for a blood because he was in a blood neighborhood and he wore the colors but he was not an actual gang member but because of those um, two identifiers they would just call him uh, a gang member. I can tell you know yeah. this question of who is a gang member and who's mm -hmm. not and who wears the colors mm -hmm. um, and what is the essence of the people whom we're looking at in this film that's something that we see in uh, the next ex excerpt that I'm going to ask you Laurel to roll please. I ain't breaking no laws. If it's a crime to look this way, then I guess I'll be dead. Of I think if we really uh, sought, really to get to know uh, those involved in gangs, perhaps they could be a means by which we help solve some of the problems in our community. I don't think every gang is bad. I think there's some gangs which, in fact, could have a positive influence in community. The greatest myth is that gang members are just straight killers. Gang-related shootings, hey. best believe them involved. Hey. My 38 are involved. Late night at the daytime, every nigga I pop. I think it's about 5% of gang members who are really straight out criminals. Like dead nigga to take mine, tear down grapevines, throwing up gang signs, depending on straight and They crime. would be like criminally insane or crazy if the gang didn't exist. The gang didn't make them that way. They was that way already. I ain't, I never been violent in my whole life and I'm a gang member, like you feel me? All gang members ain't killers like me. I'm a gang member, I ain't never killed nobody. Jose, let me come to you with a comment that Ras Baraka made in that last clip we saw, where he said that only about 5% of gang members are what he would call straight out killers or hardcore criminals, whatever term we want to use. Is that a number that you subscribe to? Does it have any meaning when we talk about the issues stemming from the existence of gangs in cities? Oh, I'm not sure where that number uh, comes from, and, um, but I will say that, at least in New Jersey, is uh, extremely difficult to really place a number um, in, in terms of gang-related uh, uh, violence or gang members. Let me, let me step away from the specific number and then deal with the question of whether there's just an infinitesimally small percentage of people we associate with gangs who are truly violent by their nature, by their upbringing, and that the rest are largely led into that universe? Well, I, I, I don't want to speak to, you know, um, whether they're violent because of their upbringing or otherwise, but I can say that the gang membership um, and gangs involved in violence across New Jersey represents um, a much higher rate than, than 5%. So it seems to me, Cornell, that there's a question that perhaps doesn't even matter. Does it matter whether it's 5% who would be crazy anyway, or whether there are 90% who are led by those five? The fact is, we've got a real dangerous, threatening situation here. Is that something that you would agree with, a statement yes. you would agree with? But I, I think the, the issue is not merely uh, the mathematical percentage, 
of gang members who are in fact violent. But the fact of the matter is we have a violent culture in which gangs thrive and we have a number of young people who are involved in gangs or gang affiliated whom we can reach, whose lives we can turn around uh, and we need to focus on that. We heard Reverend Jackson say not all gangs are bad. Does that statement make any sense? I think it's, uh, it's I wouldn't go so far as, as to say uh, gangs aren't bad. What I will say is that uh, as, as uh, Dr. Robert Johnson made the point in the film, that gangs serve a purpose. To the extent that we have disconnected youth, young people who are disconnected from school, work, and families, who find themselves adrift uh, without any support, and they gravitate toward gangs. And so to the extent that gangs are serving a real need, a, a crying need of, the, of, the, of a child's heart, of the young people's hearts, uh, we've got to address that. And so the issue is not simply not condemning gangs, uh, although the violent criminal behavior should be condemned. But the real issue is what are we doing to make, get children out of gangs, get young people out of gangs into constructive activities? That's the real point here. That's the point of the film. Well, I think it also uh, takes us to uh, Jose Perdero and what he's up against. But before we go there, let me ask you, Laurel, uh, to let's look at the next piece because it deals very directly with kids, gangs, and police. They want to solve shit and stop all the violence and all that. Like, I mean, give people chances, give them a job, I mean, see if they're going to do right. Like, instead of wiping motherfuckers out, sending them to the gang unit, locking them up in there, shooting at them, you know, that's what happens. Police like a gang, too. I, I believe that there is an issue regarding police community relations and communication and, and getting everybody on the same page. I think that there could be an issue of public trust. And I think it's something that, that um, is traditional in this city. There is a history here of, of difficult police community relations. And, you know, we have to do some things to try and overcome that. Once you process, you lost us. You know, we don't like with the police or nothing administrative anyway. We don't trust y'all motherfuckers like y'all don't trust us. So trust gotta be earned. You, you gotta have the respect to gain trust. And the way you get respect is by giving my a way out. You think I wanna see my little homies dying? My big bros dying? You know, I'd like to be everything to everybody, but we can't do it. You know, we have to, we have to do what, what we're designed to do, which is enforce the law and reduce crime. Now within that construct, we're willing to try other things, but primarily that's what we do. Akintola, there's a sense from the young folks that you talk to that they view many of them, the police, as just another gang, that there's a wide gap of mistrust. Did you gain any deeper insight into that gap, that in mistrust, and that perspective while you were putting this film together? I, I believe I already had the insight, and it's basically exactly as the, as the kids say, there's a lack of trust on both sides, and until both of these sides can come together and talk to each other and see each other for that commonality instead of their differences, that gap will remain. But let me just press that a little more because okay. we know that in Newark and around the country, there have been effort after effort to have people sit down at tables, talk to each other. There have been truces and, and other arrangements. When you say talk to each other, do you mean more than just have conversation? Yeah, I mean listen to each other and then take the things that are learned in those conversations and implement them into actions that can enable these people to do different things with their lives. Jose, that sounds great, but I wonder how you actually go about doing that? Well, uh, I think, um, th I mean, there's some truth to um, all of these uh, discussions. Um, you know, I don't believe there's a conflict between effective and professional policing with uh, respectful policing and respectful of the people that you are policing, whether they're young people or not so young people. I don't think there's a conflict. Yeah, or but is it just a question of, of respect? I mean, we're talking about kids who are in large numbers involved with drugs and crime. So the, I think the request is treat them in some special different way, and it does ask more of you than what law enforcement is generally asked to do. Right, I, and law enforcement has you know, a primary responsibility. I think the director of Newark uh, was right on point. You know, uh, first and foremost, law enforcement is there to protect uh, the people they serve. And, and quite frankly, 
you know, the gang problem is multidimensional. There are all kinds of issues at, at the table. But the focus of law enforcement, they're the first line defense against the, the violence uh, that we often find uh, in communities with a large gang problem. So first and foremost, uh, we like to be liked. Uh, we should do our work professionally. But first and foremost, we're responsible for doing what's necessary, legally necessary, to reduce violence. Cornell, this is an old conundrum. I mean, I've heard uh, Attorney General Milgram, I've heard Jose, I've heard others say we can't arrest our way out. On the other hand, the forces with which the police are confronted are people, some of whom are engaging in criminal conduct. Certainly. So how do you create some space in which something else can happen? Certainly. I think the issue is, is not merely having trust. Uh, it's a matter of creating trust in the context of a sustained relationship by bringing the right parties to the table. That is to say, uh, to help uh, Director Cadero do his job by bringing faith, uh, faith leaders to the table, uh, social workers to the table, uh, teachers, educators, uh, former gang members to the table, bringing all of these parties to the table to work with gangs. What about the current leadership in any given circumstance, the current gang leaders? The best research demonstrates that if you bring the leadership to the table, current gang members, and, be, and work with them to allow those who are in gangs who want to either get out or to refrain from violent activity to do so, that that works. You look at uh, Charlotte, you compare New York to LA. Over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, we've learned the lesson that if you work with gangs, not, I'm, I'm saying not compromise law enforcement, but make law enforcement smart as well as being tough. It works in city after city. We've seen 20, 30 percent decreases in, in, in violent activity. Well, now there's, there's another aspect to all of this, and that is that so many of these kids do have a record. They've been to prison, and they come out, and they're faced with the problem that you deal with at the Institute every day, which is prisoner reentry. So, Laurel, let's take a look at that. I want to be a normal, productive citizen just like everybody else. I got no problem working or none of that, but the jobs ain't available. All the decent jobs that's available once you got a criminal record, especially if you got a violent felony on your jacket, is a wrap. Mostly everybody that's banging been locked up for a drug charge before, and that knocked you out for a lot of jobs too. So it make it virtually impossible to fit back in the mainstream society. What do you do after you get out of jail? Um, you don't have a job. You don't have educational skills. You have a whole lot of deterrence to a whole variety of uh, work environments because, because you have a felony conviction or you have uh, or, or whatever, you just can't get a whole number of jobs. And so the thing you can do, however, is get involved in an illegal economy. That illegal economy is usually involved with gangs. So for the person who's in the gang in the first place, they are driven by our system to go back into the gang. It's very hard to resist that call back into criminality, especially because doors are being slammed on you. Businesses don't want to hire you because they view you as a, as a threat to their businesses. You can't get a license. You, know, you want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a cab driver. Well, they're not going to issue a cab license in the state of New Jersey and many other places because there's a lot of legislation that denies you that. Um, you want to go just work a warehousing job out by the airport. Wait, whoops, there's something called the New Jersey, New York uh, Waterfront Commission that has this big zone out there that they're not even going to let you uh, get a job out there. Uh, because they consider you a homeland security risk when you're just a nonviolent drug offender. You telling me to put down my guns and don't sell the drugs, but I can't get no more job. Cornell, in New Jersey, you are one of the people who would be called Mr. Reentry because you've really, along with the Institute, pushed this idea aggressively. But one of the young people says, how do I work for seven fifty an hour when I can make so much more on the street? when this job is sedentary and doesn't seem to go anywhere and there's excitement out here. How do you overcome that part of the problem in terms of this job issue? Number one, we have to make uh, economic opportunities real. That's by eliminating the barriers that keep people from getting the jobs that are meaningful. In other words, we have legal barriers out there that prevent people from even being considered for jobs. Jobs that can lead them uh, to real opportunity uh, in terms of being able to support their families, pay taxes, contribute to their communities. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you can't drive a cab, if you can't cut hair, if you can't work at the port because of artificial legal barriers, collateral sanctions that are not related to the cr crime. I mean, some of the best research shows that after a certain point, of, certain point in time, robbers, uh, people who broke the law, uh, low-level drug dealers are no more of a risk than either one of us, than any of us. 
in terms of, uh, of being hired for a job. So in other words, we've got to become smart, rational in terms of how we treat literally thousands of people coming back to our cities who want to work, want to support their families, want to pay child support. We, in, in effect, we have to get out of their way. We have to allow them to be able to compete and contribute to the society. Jose, and we can do that. Jose, if that is in fact the case, then as gangs are, are you to be expected to provide jobs? Is that realistic? To help remove the barriers uh, that Cornell's talking about? What can you do about these underlying essential problems? Well, the, I mean, the governor's crime plan, which is really the script for what we're doing uh, throughout New Jersey, not only uh, uh, entails a law enforcement component, but also has a re-entry and a prevention component. And they, um, the, 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 those initiatives are led by directors, and we coordinate our efforts so that if we're doing work in a particular city, in a particular county, uh, we not only go in with the law enforcement aspect, but we're looking to uh, the other uh, prevention and the reentry, because I, I, I agree, I think the reentry effort uh, and, and, and is important, it's very important, it makes no sense if someone coming out of jail is tomorrow's problem. And so we have today's problem, again, uh, a, a revolving process by which we really make a little inroad. So Jose, and I, I do want to get to the uh, question of whether kids who are in gangs do want out, whether they are glad to be in, whether they would do something else if they had the opportunity. So Laura, let's look at the last clip. I ain't getting out of no gang life. This is me for life. This is forever. Whatever I choose to do, if I want to do right or do wrong, this is what I am. Till I die, I ain't getting this to change now. Probably get, if I had a way out, yeah, I'd get out. Probably try to take up a little trade, finish playing ball and all that, my man. Try to get back into the real life, my man. Majority of guys I meet, uh, they would give it up in a hot second uh, if they had a real opportunity. And the thing that you, they've got to understand from us is that we will be there uh, to engage with them, uh, to mix our spirit, uh, spirit and our potential with them, uh, to work together. Only gang leaders with high positions is going to be able to stop this. Akintola, we've got just about a minute and a half left, but let me ask you, do these kids want out? It varies, but a lot of these kids are in the gangs for protection in the first place. And a large majority of them would leave if they could. But the un or the written rule of the gangs is that you either give 60 years of your life or you get six feet, you know, meaning they kill you. So there isn't a real opportunity for a lot of these people to leave. There is a smaller opportunity for some of them to do different things while they're involved in the gangs. But that kind of permission can only be granted from gang uh, leaders with high positions. Um, real quick, I just wanted to talk about that last question, though, because it was something that we just skipped right over. We've got one minute left. Okay, our prevention and intervention and reentry efforts have to include alternative means of, of, of training for these people so that they can explore their creative interests and get uh, training in careers that will allow them to really you know, grow within that because these jobs let's are let mostly get, dead end. Last word in from Cornell yeah. and Jose. Cornell, 20 years from now, is our gang still going to be a dominant dynamic in Newark and Jersey City and other urban centers around the country? I like to believe that, that that won't be the case. I like to believe that we're smart enough and committed enough to uh, ensure that our young people, a generation. If you could point to one thing that's the essential to getting there, what would that be? Number one, give people real economic opportunity. Jose, do you agree with that, that economic opportunity is the key to our being essentially gang free in a generation? I think it's a part of it, but I also believe that the law enforcement has a lot of work to do, and we need to continue the progress that, that we're making, relieving some of the pressure off our street corners so when these kids want to get away from the gang life, they can. Akintola, I cut you off, or Sandy and I did together, last concept. Do you think economics are the key? Ten seconds. I think economics, but also uh, training in life skills, uh, job skills, and, and career options. You great, know, a also, great yeah. ten second answer. <laughs> With our thanks to Cornell Brooks, director of the Institute of Social Justice, to filmmaker Akintola Hanif, and to New Jersey gang czar Jose Cordero. That's it for this edition of Due Process. But we'll be back next week with more on law and justice. Till then, from Sandy King and all of us here at Due Process, 
I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. Feel some. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.